It is my distinct privilege to welcome everybody to this, our fifth <coughs> uh, lecture in a whole series of uh, programs we've been doing this academic year on immigration to the United States. Um, and I thank you all for coming and for um, your loyalty and your interest. And uh, everyone is a gem, I know, and I promise you a good one tonight. These lectures are sponsored by the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice at the College of St. Scholastica and funded in part by the Warner Series, a lecture series of the Manitou Fund, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Ever Foundation and the Mary C. Van Ever Foundation Endowed Fund in memory of William Van Ever, a former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received from the Edwin H. Eddy Foundation, the Royal D. Allworth Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth, the UMD Department of World Languages and Cultures, Reader Weekly of Duluth, and from numerous other private sources. Thank you all so much for your continued support. As I said, my name, by the way, is Tom Morgan. I'm the director of the Allworth Center uh, here at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth. Uh, if you're new to this um, endeavor and want to be on our mailing list or kept up to date on what's going on, just send me an email. My email uh, is uh, tmorgan, pretty simple, at css.edu. Or, um, and if you do that and give me your email address, I'll put you, there's, there it is, my email address is right on the screen. If you do that, uh, I will make sure you're on a, on a regular e email list and we'll get updated on upcoming programs. If you wanna send me your street address, um, we can send you regular postcards on, uh, to update you on current events, or you can send me both and you'll get both, emails and postcards. Happy to do it. Uh, after our program this evening, <clears throat> we, uh, I invite you to ask questions of our speaker, uh, please put your questions, type your questions in. There's a, a Q and A button There should be at the bottom of your screen. You type them in there and I will assemble them. I'll gather them here on my end of the screen and I'll try to put them in some order and put them to our speaker. Your words, your questions, but sometimes questions are repetitive and I'll try to avoid that happening by combining things. And so we'll definitely do a question and answer period after the talk. And so I encourage you to stay for that. Um, our speaker this evening is someone who from the start seemed to be destined to write about culture and about blending cultures. More on that later, I'm sure. She is an award-winning journalist who has reported on politics, religion, and more from Mexico, El Salvador, the Caribbean, Japan, and India. A former Los Angeles Times Bureau Chief and member of the Houston Chronicle Editorial Board, she also has written for the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, The Economist, O, The Oprah Magazine, and Salon. In addition to that, she's the author of The Immigrant Advantage, What We Can Learn from Newcomers to America About Health, Happiness, and Hope. That book, by the way, is available at the bookstore at Fitker's here in Duluth and it's been made into an audiobook as well. Claudia Coker lives in Houston with her twin 16-year-old children, Elliot, who's a talented young artist, and Anna, who is an intense soccer player. Their father, Michael Stravato, is an accomplished photojournalist with a distinguished career that includes stints with the Associated Press and with the New York Times. Our speaker is now Associate Director, Intellectual Capital, Marketing and Communications at the Jones Graduate School of Business at Rice University in Houston. She's the editor of Rice Business Wisdom. And she's still a working reporter, making regular contributions to the publications where she once worked full time. When she's not working at Rice University, writing articles on a freelance basis or mothering, she enjoys running, hiking, surfing, looking after her dogs, and reading aloud on Zoom with her mom and her kids. She doesn't claim to be an authority on US immigration policy, but she has had a lifetime of experience working and living with immigrants and believes that they have something to teach us native-born Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, 
please welcome Ms. Claudia Kolker. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this series. I have really enjoyed the earlier speakers and the way their lectures have delved into data, the future, the deep past, and the tumultuous present. And if you haven't got a chance to see the other links, they are really good. I recommend it. So now I'm going to talk about yet another facet of the immigrant experience, resourcefulness. I'm going to discuss the huge range of useful skills and human insights that foreign born people bring here um, and wherever they go. And I'll talk about what we can learn about resolving our own American problems um, using the insights of the immigrants who are already here with us. Then I'll describe two practices that I discovered while researching my book and still practice and recommend today. One of them from Southern Mexico helps new moms make the weeks after having a baby relaxing, safe, and rather fun. And I think they also can serve us now as we try to stay safe from infection ourselves. The other practice is from Southeast Nigeria, and it's a kind of a social club that you and your friends join automatically when you're born. And then you continue with your whole life as a tool to change the worst problems that you as a group identify in your community. Um, you do that and you have fantastic parties at the same time. So these are definitely practices we could use in American life. Uh, and this makes sense to me. Being an immigrant, after all, it's not like it's an ethnicity or it's a career choice. It's just a description of a process, of a way that ordinary people of all kinds left a place that couldn't sustain them in some critical way and arrived in a new place with survival skills that sometimes are more effective here in the United States, their new home. First though, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself and why I care so much about this topic. I'm originally from Washington, DC, actually the suburbs right outside DC. And I've been a reporter pretty much all my adult life. My mom is from Mexico City. She came here when she was 12. And my late dad was Jewish from a family that had, has lived in Baltimore since the 19th century. They met in botany class freshman year at the University of Maryland. My dad was just 16. My mom dropped her pencil. He retrieved it for her. And that was all she wrote. And in retrospect, I wonder if she really dropped that pencil by accident. But in any case, they dated for seven years. Um, later taking the Greyhound from Mexico City, where she was in graduate school, to Baltimore, where he was taking pre-med courses, back and forth. They braved some resentment from sorority girls who didn't like the handsome future doctor being taken out of circulation, and also later some serious resistance from his family. And that is until they married. And then my mom, who never converted, um, became their kin. And after that, after marriage, after she was bonded with them, her interests were their interests. Um, in fact, my Jewish grandmother pushed my mom to finish getting her PhD. Their path was her path and she adored them like her own family. And that kind of attachment to someone that originally might seem like the other, I found myself is a learnable habit and it's a really powerful one as you'll see. So this was such an epic love story and they enjoyed each other's cultures so much that what I grew up with, which is not universal by any means with people from mixed backgrounds, but what I grew up with was a sense that more is more. And my dad in particular just loved foreigners. On weekends, we would head down to the Washington Monument. And often if he'd see Japanese tourists studying the old fold out paper maps, he would greet them in Japanese that he learned in the military service in Okinawa and bring them home for bagels and locks at our house. So it wasn't surprising that when I got older, I headed out to work as freelance reporter, first in El Salvador. There for about four years, I wrote about how people invented, reinvented their lives and even their country after the terrible civil conflict there that killed about 75,000 people. El Salvador is also where I first got a glimpse of the people who become immigrants and what they may be leaving behind, what may push them from their countries. Of all the interviews I did during that time, the one that stayed with me and informs what I do now 
was with a young woman gorilla. And she was probably not even 20. And she was famous for having nerves of steel. And she was a lethal sharpshooter. She was absolutely fearless. She had lost her family in the war. So when I asked her what she wanted to do later, she was she had defied stereotypes. She was such a, you know, had taken such a different path with her life than a typical country girl. Um, she said she just wanted to have kids and be a mom. In other words, she wanted normalcy. When it's time for me to come home, I headed for a job in Houston. And like a lot of Houstonians, I told myself it would be a couple of years. And I remember almost crying when I saw the hideous billboards lining the highway from the airport. Also, like many, many Houstonian newcomers, I fell in love with the place. My neighborhood now, it's leafy and it's full of lemon and grapefruit trees. Texans of all stripes are born storytellers, it's a rule. And because Houston is the top refugee destination and the most diverse city in the country, the stories here are endless. In my late 30s, I got pregnant. And that's when I quickly realized that my nomadic life had not prepared me at all for things like baby care, household finance, or regular meal preparation. So like anybody would, I started paying close attention to my friends who seemed to have it together on such matters. Houston being Houston, they were often foreign born. Um, I began to notice that these immigrants or sometimes the, the adult kids of immigrants, they seem to have smart, detailed problem solving systems they'd gotten from their families, systems that made them very confident and systems I just had never heard of. And my friends were so generous and these practices, even just listening to them and observing them seemed so sensible that I eventually started asking other foreign born people for life guidance too. And eventually I began to call this endeavor the question. For a couple of years, whenever I struck up an acquaintance with someone from another country, I would ask it, what is the smartest thing that people in your country do that you want to hang on to and other Americans should copy? Everyone had an answer. Mexican rituals for new mothers, Vietnamese clubs that help you save money no matter what, Korean techniques for getting the best out of public schools, Jamaican strategies for three generations buying a house together in order to afford better school districts. I picked, for my book, I picked the ones that solve the most pressing American concerns, um, that were most relevant to American uh, preoccupations. And in the years since, I have adopted um, or practiced almost every one of these practice, practices, and I use them to this day. Um, in contrast, though, to 10 years ago, when I started looking into this, there are now extensive data confirming the effectiveness of a lot of these practices. You know, these, you know, these could have been written off as uh, quaint folk practices. Not much had been written about them at the time. And in many cases, um, the, the new research uh, explains why they work, the mechanisms. Most dramatically, um, the research shows that immigrants live longer than American-born white people. So contrary to the most basic public health principles, which link socioeconomic advantage to health, Latino life expectancy in, the, in 2014 in the United States was 81.8 years versus 78.8 years for non-Hispanic United States white people. Even US born Latinos live two years longer approximately than US born whites. Taken together, these trends are known as the immigrant health paradox, or sometimes the, um, the immigrant epidemiological paradox. And while it's still um, partially unsolved, researchers do link it to less smoking, self-selection in deciding to immigrate. There, there's even um, some evidence that shows that um, uh, Mexican people who come here, the, the family will choose the person who is maybe the healthiest um, and uh, the smartest. Traditional or poverty-based diets that are plant-based, not because it's trendy, but because no one can afford meat or processed food, and really rich social networks and family networks. Plus another thing, um, an overall sense of purpose or hopefulness that can come when you know you've taken charge of your destiny by, by trying to change a bad situation or you know that you are helping your loved ones back home. Here's a quote. 
Hispanic immigrants persistent life expectancy advantage should be a wake up call for all Americans, according to one research team. Life expectancy is a leading indicator of a nation's health. Immigrants may be stereotyped as drains on the health system, but the reality is that their health behaviors and longevity set a standard, which we believe US born Americans should strive to attain. Immigrants in this country also have surprisingly good birth outcomes. African refugee women, for example, experienced healthier pregnancies than women, women like me, who are born in the United States. And that is despite receiving much less prenatal care, according to a recent University of Buffalo study. Similarly, Mexican women immigrants, women who have many of the worst risk factors for bad pregnancy outcomes, quote, have superior birth outcomes when compared to US born women, one literature review found. Social support, familism, which is an orientation toward the family, healthy diet, limited use of cigarettes and alcohol, and religion may all play a role. But I was to find the concept of social support for the mother means something far different than signing up for pottery barn registries or buying adorable tiny clothes, the little ears. At its most rigorous, um, it means something called a quadantena, a regimen of care and attention for mothers in the first 40 days after having a baby that is so intense, it's sometimes referred to as mothering the mother. Here's what I'm talking about. Imagine climbing a craggy, foggy hill in Southern Mexico, and you hear somebody giggling. The sound is coming from a hut shaped like a beehive, which when you get close to it, is bathed in the scent of fresh eucalyptus. The person giggling is a new mother, whose name is Ana Rosa. She's relaxing with the village sauna mistress and her best friend who are telling her dirty jokes. These women are taking part in a life-saving mandatory ritual for new mothers observed in Chiapas and in other vari variations around the world, including the United States. This is the Quarantena, and it requires new mothers to observe 40 days of social isolation, except for their closest families and friends. As a result, I believe, Rural women um, from Mexico, like Ana Rosa, are among the world's experts in appreciating and complying with medical quarantine. What they know, I think, can help the rest of us in protecting ourselves um, from exposure to COVID and its variants. So it's no coincidence that the word quarantena probably sounds familiar. Like the word quarantine, it comes from the Latin word for 40, um, the traditional number of days for medical isolation for infectious diseases. And traditional quarantenas are indeed enforced by the whole community. Here are the rules. For the first six weeks after giving birth, a new mother must stay at home and in some cases must stay in bed. Um, Ana Rosa's village had two mandatory exceptions. She must have two or three aromatherapy saunas with her friends no baby, someone else is taking care of the baby. Plus, she has to accept a couple of house calls from the village massage therapist. Only an irresponsible mother would dare to skip either duty. The goal, exactly the same as the social distancing we're practicing here, to keep vulnerable people safe. In remote areas like Chiapas, with no doctors, no plumbing, no medicine, no money to pay for medicine, and animals like pigs and chickens underfoot, just walking outside can expose a new mother to a lethal infection. Families know from experience what research shows. The loss of a new mother endangers the well-being of all of her children, and it even can destabilize the whole community, which would have to take care of those kids. But a quarantan is also designed to shore up the mom's immune system, not, not just remove her, but to bolster it. In contrast to the current pressures we put on our new moms to use their time at home to achieve, a quarantena forbids new moms to do anything taxing at all. During pregnancy, she may walk miles for water and firewood. She probably cooks and scrubs often until the day she gives birth. Then during the quarantena, 
She's not allowed to wash even one dish. No laundry, no, co no cooking at all. She's especially forbidden to even touch a broom. Instead, everyone in the community and her family treats her cuarentena like a medical, um, medically, emotionally, and even a spiritually sacred time. A woman is a good mother if she just rests. In traditional cultures, like Ana Rosa's, it's the grandmother who typically organizes a loved one to do 100% of the new woman's, chore, a new woman's chores. So the neighbors will drop off special foods. Um, chicken soup is a, a big thing. So is a special kind of chocolate um, with cinnamon. I'm going to show you. Uh, Mexican people in Houston still love this. It's called abuelita. And the way you make it, it's got a dash of cinnamon and it comes in tablets. And there's a special wooden implement that you rub back and forth and little rings make the chocolate very frothy. Um, they might give her um, uh, a vegetable soup with something uh, with wild purslane, um, also known in Spanish as verdolagas. And I got a little growing here because I'm obsessed with it. It's a powerful anti-inflammatory and it has the highest amount of essential uh, omega-3 fatty acids, which are essential um, to our body's functioning and to our immune systems. Of any plant, there is. Um, and along with her new baby, the mother is not only nourished, she's protected. She's treated as if she herself is the newborn. So this is a mindset that recent generations of Americans have not felt the need to adopt or to apply to mothers around us. Yet for new mothers in this country, that undervaluing of care has led to an epidemic of maternal mortality, an epidemic in which fully half of deaths happen after a mother has given birth. African-American women suffer from this crisis by far the most. Meanwhile, a few years after having her first baby in Chiapas, Ana Rosa moved to Akron, Ohio, where her husband found a job in a tree nursery. There, too, Ana Rosa spent 40 days after giving birth at home. She quit her minimum wage job in a pencil factory. Her only female relative, um, her sister-in-law, Carmen, took on all cleaning and cooking and emotional duties. So when I visited their tiny apartment, Carmen, who was broad-shouldered and kind of brusque, she was dressed in gym shirts and a t-shirt. She looked exhausted. But Ana Rosa, lounging with her baby as bananas were simmering on the stove, looked incredibly relaxed. So this extreme attentiveness to new mothers helps us explain some of the really astonishing aspects of Latino maternal health according to Dr. Emily Ramirez at UT Health San Antonio. In the United States, where Mexican-born women are among the poorest, least, least educated newcomers, their babies are 10% less likely to die in the first hour, day, week in life than those of non-Hispanic US-born women. In Houston, I talked to a 73-year-old house cleaner named Eva Hernandez who remembered her long ago quarantena in Mexico City dreamily. I didn't do much of anything, she said. I just relaxed and I looked at my handsome baby. But now in Houston, at her age, although social isolation is just as medically important for her as it was when she had a baby, she can't afford to stay home and stay safe. Even so, she keeps the habit of meticulously safeguarding her health. I wear my little mask whenever I leave the house, she told me. I protect you and you protect me. Today, I think the quarantena's habits of humility um, and prevention can help us defend ourselves against exposure to COVID-19 and its variants. In the mountains where I live, there were no doctors, Ana Rosa said, no medicine. We could just go someplace to fix things if we got sick. During the era of COVID-19, the quarantena habit shows that humble daily choices, as they do in Chiapas, can save lives. New mothers can be nurtured like newborn babies. We can alter our habits, like the Mexican male laborers in Akron who improvise the housework and learn how to cook to let their wives rest because there are no women around to help. Being gentle is definitely a kind of medical care. 
And most important of all, protecting the vulnerable is a prescription for protecting ourselves. Now, I want to tell you about a party. Definitely the most gorgeous, memorable party I've ever been to. Remember parties? So this one at an airport motel in Atlanta reminded me of a bash on Mount Olympus. It was the meeting of the community organization of the town of Agulu in southwestern Nigeria. Um, and this is an Igbo community. Their members have known and helped their home village always as a team since they were toddlers. So as I peeped from the hallway, a jaw-dropping cavalcade of men and women sailed into the ballroom before me. The men were burly and they were resplendent in brocade skull caps and lavish tunics that matched. The women wearing the same gleaming heavy fabrics as their husbands were majestic in mermaid gowns and metallic headdresses that looked like they were two or three feet high. There were platters of fiery tilapia, of snowy white fufu and simmering beef. There was intoxicating music. And close to the end, at the moment just before the elders deluged the younger kids in a blizzard of dollar bills, one of the adults who was a doctor took me aside and he told me that although this Nigerian practice, which is based on a tradition that's called age grades, although this practice was one of the best things in his whole life, he doubted that his own kids who were there at the party could figure out how to form and continue this tradition themselves after being born in the United States. And I thought he was probably right. And of all the practices that I studied and tried out for my research, the age grades were the ones that I thought could most enrich life for ordinary Americans. But if only we could figure out how to apply the basic idea. Here's how they work. In many tribes in Nigeria, including the Igbo, the moment you're born, you're in the club. You are in the age grade of the year you were born. You don't know it, of course. Then your parents start pointing at the other kids in your age grade. At 10, an elder might dispatch all your friends to sweep the ilo, which is a central meeting place. At 17, you might be sent always as part of a team to clear the washing area of the river or patch roofs on houses for widows. And as an adult, no matter whether you end up in Nigeria in your, or you stay in your same village or you're in London or Houston, you start paying dues, small dues, five to eight dollars a month if you're in Nigeria, always as a team. And then you start voting as a group on ways that your age grade wants to improve your village. The other thing is that it's incredibly competitive. Igbos are famously industrious and entrepreneurial. And as an age grade gets older, they like to do things that are spectacular things their government won't do for them, things that other age grades wish they'd done. So a library, a medical clinic, an electrical generator for the whole village. My, my editor friend, Peter, uh, who now lives in Canada explained, we, when we got together in Houston, uh, we danced together uh, to express uh, reliance on each other and relief. We got together and we danced into the wee hours in the morning. We settled family disputes for each other. And we stocked the libraries in our village using the money we collected every month. But I kept asking myself, well, how could Americans copy that? This was the year I finally figured it out. In the original um, experience of age grades, when I, when I saw that incredible party, I thought my village, you know, I'm from a suburb called Chevy Chase, Maryland. My village doesn't need my money. Um, I couldn't afford to buy a house there um, and it would be relevant. And this year, like many, maybe most Americans, I suddenly realized how deeply um, lacking this society that I really love is. Um, and I realized that um, we maybe have electricity, but we are missing um, a, a 
basic functionality in um, resolving, understanding our history and making the society equitable for African Americans. And this was the year that I understood history, that I understood the history of the GI Bill, of housing law, of all kinds of things I, I knew nothing about. And I decided I wanted to find a way to make fixing that, make working on it a lifelong project, not a Band-Aid project, not something you see something that devastates you on TV and you send some money and then you move on and you forget, you scroll on. It's gonna take a lifetime. It's gonna take the lifetime of this country to address these things. That's the attitude that um, EBO age grades have. It's a lifetime to uh, invest in and prop up and enrich the culture that they came from. It's a commitment. So I spoke to friends, I spoke to Nigerian friends about what really makes an Igbo tick. I talked to people like my mother-in-law, who's a political old time political organizer about what makes groups work and how we could finally do it. And this is what I did. I asked a bunch of friends um, who I had known from college or known for years and years, would you be interested in joining with me once a week, talking for 15 minutes about something we've learned or, or, um, or wanted to invest in or assist in African-American life in the United States. Our village, finally, my country is my village and it needs electricity. It needs, um, it needs a reliable power source. Um, and the, the dues would be $5, $5, um, $5 a, um, a week because the idea is not to make a major fundraiser. The idea is to, um, is to invest, to have skin in the game and make it a habit. So what, what I was trying to do was make this a rhythm of my life. And there's all kinds of research about habits. You've got to do them regularly a certain number of times. There has to be some reward. So for me, my reward was talking once a week or even texting once a week with the one person who said yes. This is my old pal who very coincidentally is someone I've known since I was a toddler. This is a pal of mine that we discovered when we met in college that we had gone to pre-K together. And I remember him well, because he was a riot, always always has been. He's now a, a, a TV writer um, and a movie writer. Um, what I remember from when we were three or four years old is being in a classroom together that was completely paralyzed because one kid, my friend, was hiding under a table wearing a jaunty pilot's cap and refusing to leave. And the teacher was crying and the kids in the class were cracking up or stunned or crying too. And he had derailed the entire class. Uh, but it was, it was pretty funny and I remembered it and it took forever to realize, oh my gosh, we knew each other and we, I always thought he was, he was fun. So my treat is to text or be in touch on a weekly basis with this old friend of mine. And our plan was, let's just do this from August to the election. And our plan was we will only give to black businesses or causes, not to political parties. This, is, this has to be sustainable. And this is a, we are reading, keeping up and getting invested, feeling attached, uh, feeling that we are village mates. And the funny thing is, as habits do, it stuck. It stuck, we've carried it on. We often just trade texts back and forth, but we keep an eye on the news. This is, this is our interest, this is our problem. This is our shared community. And it's been really fun. And it's, it's been exciting to have something to continue to care about um, long after the elections. And it's, it feels healthy, it feels good to not compartmentalize something that is um, hundreds of years old, a problem, uh, a, a deep, complicated um, conundrum that is, is part of the history of the American village. So I asked another friend of mine, um, Ben, who is um, a scientist who also did an age grade. Um, I asked him, do you have um, a problem with Americans um, appropriating this? Does this feel like cultural appropriation? He said, absolutely not. He said, not only that, it's something that works very well for schools. My high school has metamorphosed the age grade idea. Um, we may not all be in the same, um, born in the same year, but we do the exact same system. 
and we will do it forever. And we apply um, our gathered money to improve the school. He said, it's a very malleable system. It just has to be regular. It has to be democratic and doable, just five or eight bucks. Um, and it's got to be really fun. And he said, uh, you, might, you might recommend that if your graduating class from college uh, is looking for something like this, which in fact, my graduating class is because we didn't have a reunion um, this year. He suggested, go for your own town, the town that your college is in. Find an African-American program if that's what you want and give to that. He liked the idea of being local. So that's another group, um, another approach. You know, we're trying to, you know, be, have our finger on the pulse of the American village. He said, go local. I think one drop in the ocean actually makes a difference. And he said, you know what, if you want, make me an honorary member. So that is my Adriate experience. And it's a habit. I don't feel right um, if I haven't touched base with my friend. And it's been the most joyful element of this whole crazy pandemic. So I have to admit, I was thinking strictly about my own needs more than a decade ago when I began asking the question, what's the smartest habit people from your country bring with them? that you think you should hang on to and that we Americans should copy. Now, not every traditional practice deserves to be preserved, far from it. But as I learned um, about and I experienced the practices in my book um, and picked out the ones that were best suited to American goals and values, I was struck by the depth of their insights into universal human motivations. What, what makes us stick to projects? What makes us um, happy? And what our bodies and our psyches really need to be well? Immigrants from white, Latino, and other racial groups also have higher levels of happiness than people born in the United States. This is according to a 2019 study from Florida State, Florida State University. And people who've lived for a prolonged period in another country also have higher levels of something that's called self-concept clarity, which is your inner concept of yourself. There's a lot of research that already links this self-concept clarity to an array of positive outcomes, real ones, from a sense of well-being to successful marriages to physical health. According to research from Rice Business, where I work, living abroad boosts that self-concept clarity because it forces us to understand who we are, what, what we're going to do in foreign situations, not just falling back on what we were raised to expect in life. So this is why I think the kids, grandkids of foreign-born people, and also those from traditional Native American communities, should go out of their way and ask their elders the question, what, what do you value most from our tradition? What do you think we need to hang on to and others should copy? I found that ingenious as they are, most of the practices that I chose for this book turn out not to be thoroughly foreign at all. I found that they are usually variations on American good sense and on American customs that just faded as we became more industrialized, more urban, more affluent, more independent of each other. These rituals and practices are designed over millennia sometimes to promote thrift and good health and community and backbone. And versions of these practices, I think you'll find, lie packed away in every American's family history. For the thousands of newcomers who land in this country each year, long-term success is gonna hinge on one factor, how well they learn to be American. For the rest of us who know our good fortune already, but are still struggling to keep families close, our bodies healthy, and our community whole, for us, the challenge is different. We need to learn to live like immigrants. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudia, for uh, a, a really informative 
talk and a nice cap on our whole season of talking about immigrants. Already, I have a question for you. If you take a deep breath and let me ask you this question. Are you ready for that? By the way, I forgot to tell everybody in the introductions that, that Claudia is in Houston, Texas, and I'm in Duluth. I guess you all perhaps <laughs> figured that out, but I thought I should make that clear. Yeah, you're at your home. So you're looking at Texas air there, right around you, right? <laughs> Right. Well, here's our first question, and I hope uh, not the only one, because please type your questions in in the Q&A, and I'll, I'll handle them in due course. But this one um, will give you something to think about, I think. You mentioned that immigrants are physically and mentally more acute and perhaps healthier than some Americans. Um, but talk some more about their psychological well-being. You did a little bit, but many of them have undergone trauma and hardships. Um, and how do they deal with the kind of trauma that they bring with them in their journey to this country? This is a really important question. So this is, you know, I kind of condensed a, a longish book. And one of the big, um, one of the big, objectives in my book was to absolutely not romanticize um, or idealize. Um, there's just a lot of untreated trauma um, and it has all the effects that we know trauma, um, trauma brings to anybody. Um, so that's real, it lasts a lifetime um, and immigrants are humans like anybody else. And these are really serious, however, there are um, a, few, a few tools, a few weapons that immigrants appear to have. And again, you know, it's not like you're not, an immigrant is not a political party or a nationality. It's a regular person who was displaced, went someplace else. But, but um, it's been suggested, uh, I, I saw around the time I wrote a book, someone had done a study of about um, six different immigrant groups and they had fewer episodes of major mental health breakdowns than native born American white people. Again, people who had, you know, on the average been through much more trauma. And the researcher said he thought it had something to do with um, having a bigger picture, a sense of purpose, that self-concept clarity that I was talking about. So you think I've got to get through this because I am putting my brother in the Philippines through, through high school, you know, or I am keeping my mom alive. Um, I'm paying for medical treatment. And so that there's a certain pride and um, resilience that comes from being part of something big. So that's part of it. And then also there is, there is some evidence that the sending countries, you're not gonna send over the family member who is, um, not focused or the family member who doesn't respond well to stress because it is the, the journey here is so, so dangerous and pretty much guarantees trauma and for women, sexual assault. So many people when they come here have no idea how bad that journey is gonna be. But at the same time, people send their, their best, their toughest, their strongest because those people are keeping a whole family afloat. But that is an important question and it is, it is real. Thank you. Well, and related to that, here's another one that's kind of comes off of that. Um, would you talk a little bit about how, about the families that are left behind um, that don't immigrate and uh, how the families who have come to the United States will send money back how remittances work and how important that is in the whole family structure? Um, this is a very big question. Is the question more um, how it works economically or some of the emotional parts of it? Well, I think it's economic, but I'm only speculating. The person who asked the question could type in some more here. I'll, I'll do a little bit with that. It's such an important question and remittances are such a, um, there's such a form of power, right? Uh, this is again, you know, the, um, the power that these immigrants have, they, they work so hard. I'm thinking of you know, especially Latin American immigrants in Houston right now, but they send money home. They're supporting their parents. They're sending checks. 
it's something that, you know, if I had, um, if I had to add another chapter, I would, I write a chapter about imagine sending a check to your parents, you know, from your tiny, tiny salary. Um, many of your students may actually do that, but that's not American tradition, right? So um, remittances are essential. They're the linchpin to keeping um, countries um, functional, many countries, including Mexico, afloat. And you can go to towns there and you can see the, the houses that remittances built. Um, I've always felt like uh, working with uh, immigrant laborers and um, housekeepers and hotels, I always tip a ton. That's the best, most reliable investment of my money. I don't know what's going to happen with my 401k, but I know what's going to happen with every extra dollar my housekeeper in a hotel earns. Um, also, I saw an amazing story uh, a few months ago that um, Mexican, yeah, Mexican immigrants here have saved and sent more money home during the pandemic than they did before the pandemic. That since 2008, they were prepared uh, and strategized for economic disaster here. And so somehow, you know, think what's happened to restaurants, right? Um, so many of those people work in restaurants, somehow they have saved and sent more money home. I find that miraculous. The people who are left behind, talk about trauma. There's, um, there's a really good book called um, Enrique's Journey, which I think won a Pulitzer by a, um, uh, Sonia Nazario from the LA Times, actually. I really recommend it. It's damaging. And the question happens all the time, is this really worth it? And my personal experience with this is that at the dawn of video link-ups, let's see, this was must have been like the year 1995, um, one of the remittance um, uh, companies had just figured out, they just got expensive new equipment where you could have a video conversation with somebody in Mexico. And it was expensive and it only lasted three or four minutes. So I was in on it and I watched one and it was the first contact, a mom uh, who had been here for you know 15 years, first contact she had with her kids. It was very exciting and it was a disaster. The kids were so angry at her, so full of rage. They're like, why are you there? Why are you not here? Why did you leave us? And it was awful and it ended in tears. So that's trauma. That's, um, that's the price that is paid for keeping families afloat. Thank you. Back to the quarantina. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Could I just add a little comment on that? Well, of course, sure. That particular practice, which is practiced by, you know, this, I cannot emphasize how impoverished Ana Rosa was. Um, her, her job, such as it was, paid her almost nothing. That, that is definitely the most popular um, of the chapters in the mainstream media, and the people who love it are affluent, highly educated, professional women. And they're like, gosh, I want what that lady has. How do I get that? Mm -hmm. Well, kind of jumping off that, this comes from somebody who lives um, in an urban area in a high rise. Is it possible to bring the quarantina to a high rise building or a very highly urbanized center like that? Do you think that can work? Not, not in the traditional way. Like you're not going to get, you know, a, 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 a mud sweat bath. And um, I wish I could afford a massage therapist to do house calls twice a week to me, you know. So that stuff, no. But I actually did, I had a quarantena and I didn't know what it was at the time. It was before I wrote my book, but I had twins. I was about four, I was had twins on the way. I was about 40 and I just could not mess around. I, I could not afford to be miserable or overwhelmed. So I did a lot of research in advance and I spoke to this kind of um, crunchy granola hippie friend uh, who had twins too. And she said, this is what you're going to do. Chart out six weeks way before you have the babies and give each friend or family member that makes you the most relaxed, give them a week to come and take care of you. And I was like, that is a terrible idea. I can't even think of being a hostess for six weeks to this parade of house guests. And she said, nope. They are going to be taking care of you. They're going to be cooking and cleaning and shopping and letting you sleep. And be careful who you choose. And so the girl's dad and I chose very carefully who we wanted in the first, um, uh, in the first six weeks. And 
it was a novelist who stayed up on the third floor. She, she cooked us great meals, we made cheesecake, and then she went to the third floor to work on her book. We uh, had um, four or five days of a Trinidadian expert baby nurse who is a godmother now to my kids and taught us everything we knew, um, my sister. And it was just like Ana Rosa said, it was an incredibly relaxing experience. So the one thing is, those are big, big favors. And you're expected to reciprocate at that level. And it's, it's a big, big ask, but you can do it. It's just, you have to think about, um, you have to think about the trade-off there. And I would do anything for any of those people. I really would. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> took my breath away there for a minute. Um, is, is, let's reverse it if I can, reverse the concept of your book or your talk, is there something that immigrants learn from Americans when they come here that they, they adopt in their lives? Everything, absolutely everything. Um, and they, they learn quickly and they, um, they learn, um, they sometimes learn too much from us. For example, the weight gain in the first months in the United States is, is exponential. And I was actually working for a while on a photo essay of refugees. A friend of mine who works with refugees said the difference um, within the first six weeks, again, this deep transitional period is unbelievable. And partly they change, you know, they, they take off head coverings maybe or get rid of traditional clothes, but they start eating like Americans um, and their health declines and their life expectancy declines. So, so on a health level, there is almost nothing good about um, living in the United States, except that food is abundant and it's relatively safe. Um, you can walk and we have spectacular medical skills, if not a way of delivering it. So that's why I said, do you remember I mentioned that a lot of these practices work way better here than they do in their own country. So in Chiapas, you have to have a quarantena because infant mortality is the highest in Mexico and mothers, mothers, pass away all the time there. So you have to be militant. But Ana Rosa in the United States, she was doing great. She had spectacular American state-of-the-art care and she had fantastic self-care habits. So they, you know, people come here because they adore this culture and they, they appreciate every bit of it. And I just want to throw in a few things. They, um, people love the rule of law and they, it makes it very hard to go back because we have laws here and there's, there's relative order. And it's, it's really such a privilege to have a constitution and a legal system and a democracy. And the other thing is that I heard a lot is that we, it's imperfect, but we have, um, we have justice for women in this culture. And many people, um, for some reason, a lot of the Nigerian professional men I talked to, they, they wanted to be here for their daughters. That's, that's what they, they really valued about this culture. So everything, we give everything. And this is why people will risk their lives endlessly to be here. Thank you. Here's a, a bit of a, a long one. I'm going to read it all rather than try to paraphrase it because I have a feeling this may come from somebody you know. So I'm just going to read this to you and let everybody yeah. listen. And, um, and then you can respond as you see fit. All right. And I, I hope I'm pronouncing things right. Hi, Claudia. This is Waihan from St. <laughs> Paul. Oh, yes, I thought so, huh? I thought it was somebody in your life, huh? Originally from Malaysia. First of all, I want to thank you so much for sharing your collections of immigrant stories. They really inspired me as a new immigrant. By the way, I know an American couple who work as counselors in my native country. I see them as immigrants to Malaysia because they have stayed in Malaysia for more than 15 years. They flourish in their health, they are in their 70s, and in other well-being too. They are well-liked by the locals. Have you observed the same patterns among Americans living abroad for a long time too? There is a question there, see? Does it work for Americans going abroad? <laughs> that is such an interesting question. I guess I don't have extensive experience um but uh does it work for americans living abroad um i guess it really depends who they are where they are in the country 
um, and, uh, and how much they respect the local culture rather than just feeding off of it, you know, just using it as, um, as a, a stage set for their, their own lives. Um, you know, our, our, our American manners are, uh, um, are subject to um, some mockery, you know, we're considered innocent and um, a little goofy, overly friendly in some countries. But honestly, when I'm talking, you know, I'll talk about my own experience. I've always been treated unbelievably well. I think that's the universal experience of Americans in other countries is um, almost universal. Um, there are important exceptions, um, but uh, people have cultures of hospitality, right? And, and they, are, they shower newcomers with um, kindness and help. Thank you. Here's a comment, not really a question, but I think I'll, I'll just pass it on to you and see if you have anything to respond to. It's a comment about your uh, quarantine idea. And this uh, person says that Chinese people have similar ideas, postpartum care centers. Do you want to respond to that? Yes. Okay. I'm going to do a little pro product placement now. My friend Sylvia Kwan in Houston uh, has written a book of, of um, it's called Doing the Month in, in Asia a lot of times, uh, of recipes, of special soups and foods that um, correspond to that time. You know what, seriously, everybody, um, almost everybody does something like this. And I just discovered, and I, I wish I had heard of it, I never had at the time, that Southern African American women did this in old, back in the day. Uh, a friend of mine who's probably in her 50s told me that her mother did that. I'd absolutely never heard of it. And I almost kind of wonder, um, could it possibly be a legacy from African um, practices? There, there are many, many lingering, um, thriving practices, uh, social practices that you can kind of trace um, back to Africa. So I don't know, but I, um, I definitely know about the Chinese one. Everyone does it. And I saw an amazing job description on a Vietnamese mommy's website, and someone was looking for a soup nanny. Okay, she was she was had just had a baby. <laughs> she wanted someone whose job it was every day to make medicinal, delicious soups for her as she recovered. And I feel like we all need a soup nanny in our lives. <laughs> so I guess so. Well, this leads us into another question. Um, unlike Houston, we here in Northern Minnesota is uh, live in an area that has struggled with uh, without migration. How might our region be more welcoming to immigrants? Um. Well, you know, one thing that's working against you is um, the weather, and you know, Houston is famous for like atrociously swampy, hundred percent humidity, you know, appalling weather. But many people come here for the weather. So Nigerians love it. They're like, oh, this feels just like Lagos. And Vietnamese come here, from, like a lot of um, Vietnamese um, were landed originally in, um, uh, in Arkansas. But they were not on the, the original first destination for refugees. But refugees come here um, from developing countries, from hot countries. They love it. So unless you want 100% humidity uh, and insane, you know, 100 degree temperatures, um, that you'll never beat Houston out for that. Um, Houston also has, um, well, Texas has no state income tax. Houston has just a booming, booming, booming construction industry um, and kind of no, very few protections for workers, few unions. Um, and that's actually a draw. There's just a lot of work here. Um, so, you know, people come to Houston, people come to the United States for economic reasons. Um, but let me think about that, how to make it more welcoming. Um, can I sit with that? If, I, if, if that occurs to me, yeah. <laughs> you, you sit with that because I have another question for you okay. while you're sitting there. Okay. Um, what you're describing, what you did describe, certainly with your examples from Mexico and probably also from Nigeria, were cultures that were mostly rural. As we urbanize, 
both in the United States and in other countries like Mexico or Nigeria or any number of other places, are some of these customs going to disappear as we urbanize, regardless of where they're set it, seated? Yeah. You know, unless we're intentional about it, right? Like um, eating fresh, fresh picked vegetables from the garden. Well, that was a country thing. You know, the rest of us had canned and frozen vegetables in the 50s. And then it became, it became chic and the health value of, of um, a large range of plants in our diet became valued. So that's really one of the purposes of my book is to say, yeah, this is, um, this is something that comes from poor cultures where they don't have social safety nets and um, where they don't have functional governments a lot of times. I love having a functional government. I wouldn't give it up. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you can be intentional about the things you bring back into your life. So, but yes, especially the quarantena, the reason I wrote about the, the um, Chiapas um, women uh, in Akron, I, someone wrote a dissertation about it, is because they were so, so poor. Chiapas is so poor and they had no alternative. And, you know, um, uh, Ana Rosa had, um, I think she was completely knocked out during her um, uh, delivery, you know, which is not super fashionable. She's like, Bring it on. Those drugs were great. This is so much better than giving birth in a mud hut, you know, hanging on to a rope to alleviate the pain. Love the drugs. So um, one does not want to romanticize the environments that people come from. But they themselves, you know, that's, that's what's so interesting to asking this question is people themselves know what made them happy, what felt good. And that's a really good guidepost, in my opinion. How often do these cultural patterns hang on into the second and third generation of these immigrant families? It really, it depends entirely what they are. And it also depends on um, uh, what, you know, what the society around you is um, saying. I mean, I think lots of us have heard or maybe experienced this um, an episode of, you know, grandma or mom making her, you know, famous kimchi or her, um, you know, uh, um, some kind of smelly or aromatic food. It's a huge treat or, or special, you know, Indian pastries. And then the kids at school saying, ew, gross. And there's a lot of bad feelings about these beloved, beloved things. Now, a lot of the stuff is very chic. And actually I wrote a story about um, Asian bakeries recently. And one of the commentators was saying, yeah, you know, I, I got a lot of flack for this kind of food when I was a kid. Now it's, you know, it's, it's all in fashion. So the outside culture can, just by being open and praising and saying, hey, can I taste that? That looks good. Tell me how your mom makes it. Those little things will keep these delicious food traditions alive. And then you get a culture. Like Houston, the culture owns and claims foreign food. The comfort food of Houston, it's not even Mexican food. It's Vietnamese food. So yeah, the outside culture can do it. Um, and um and then you just have to decide, you have to ask questions. But I, I have a endless sympathy for people who are just trying to survive in that first generation. And it's too much to learn the language um, because it, it makes you feel like an outcast or um, you know, dress in your traditional clothes. That's, that's hard. It's actually a privilege for later generations to reclaim those things. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. You were having, you were thinking about that question I asked earlier about what we should do in Minnesota to be more welcoming. Um, I think here's a question that I will put to you because I, that is my obligation, but I think this is a really hard question. What do you recommend our country should do, the United States, with the tragedy of so many refugees coming now to leave their countries and now at our border? Do you have a... Well, a reaction to that? Yeah, I do. You know, this um, the movement of people and uh, the displacement of people and the incredible draw of the United States, incredible. It's not just a little different. It's, it's irresistible. What, what person wouldn't want what we have, the resources that we just lucked into? So these are fundamental American questions. And this is not... Um, oh my goodness, this thing just happened, it's an emergency. This is the dynamic of being the richest country in the world, 
um, with a very fraught history with the country next door that used to own a large part of our country. This is, this is reality. So um, uh, these, there are long-term relationships um, that need to be examined. I'm gonna give two resources. I was, I was thinking about this a lot in advance. There's a place called the Young Center um, and it's Y-O-U-N-G. And they are advocates for best practices for child, unaccompanied child um, immigrants. So they're not, um, they're not like a, a, a nonprofit activist group. They work with government um, to say, okay, what is best practices? What, how should we handle these kids who are unaccompanied, they're vulnerable, but it hurts them to stay in detention for more than a couple days. So there are really smart people working on this. Also, um, the Migration Policy Institute is um, really respected. Um, it's got a whole team of, um, of experts on this. And one of the things that their president talks about is, let's talk about helping to invest and stabilize the countries that people come from. What's, what's our role in those countries? I mean, our, our past role in them has been very, oops, extracted. Um, as uh, one of our, our previous um, speaker pointed out. So what are we gonna do to make, to reduce this disparity that has, that we have helped to build for hundreds of years between us and other countries? Here, another way of putting what you just said is the responsibilities of affluence. That's one way. Um, I'm mm -hmm. hanging on for one sec because I'm gonna look for my power cord. All right, hold please. I'm holding, we're all holding. All right, <laughs> you didn't want to see me climbing around. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Um, that's one way of putting it, but I would it's I would look at it a different way, um, sort of like the, um, the uh, African, the Nigerian eighth grade. We live here, we're all in this together. And when another country, when our neighbor, neighboring country is in a huge crisis, it affects us. You, you can't compartmentalize the peoples of the planet. We, you know, we are constantly in trade with each other, influencing each other, um, going back and forth. So I would say we need to look at big systems. And it, you know, one, of, one of the uh, examples I give all the time is, oh, so you don't want to um, inoculate a, an undocumented immigrant for tuberculosis for free. Okay, you don't want to you don't want to get that person um, any sort of encouragement to be here. Who's going to suffer from having somebody with tuberculosis in a classroom? Mm -hmm. Or you don't want to teach these kids. Um, you don't want to give them a good education. Really, when you are hiring in twenty years, that's going to be your um, your employee pool. So it's I wouldn't call it so much as um, a a debt. We do have some debts, but it's just a sense of systems. Mm -hmm. All right. We've run out of questions, but we had some good ones. Do you have any final words for us or should we wrap this up, Claudia? <laughs> I think I may have used all of my words. Um, <laughs> I think that is it. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the questions too, thank you. And we've enjoyed having you very much. It's a wonderful way to conclude this, to remind us from the beginning, from the first lecture back in the fall, that ultimately we are talking about human beings with lives and their own stories and you help bring some of that out. Thank you very much for bringing a little bit of Houston warmth <laughs> to our, we're gonna get a little snow tomorrow. So we're still uh, in a different climate than you are. Okay, well, I have actually, I have words. Come visit Houston, you will love it. All right, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you all for coming, everybody for coming. See you next fall for another program. Bye-bye. Thank you.